We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? When I was younger, I, uh, I had a situation. I was in Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts. I didn't make it to the end. I didn't become an Eagle Scout or anything like that. But uh, I was in Boy Scouts. I didn't particularly care for Boy Scouts, mostly because I didn't care for my fellow Boy Scouts. I thought most of them were jerks. Um, and they were. They were jerks. That's, that's a fair objective assessment. But... Um, we had this thing where we were supposed to do this Roman chariot race, all right, and they had these carts all set up and everything, and you, were, you had one guy that would be the horse and run holding the poles, and one, guy that, one or two guys that would ride in it, and I desperately did not want to do that. I thought it was completely humiliating to have to do that. I didn't want to do it. <clears throat> I thought, yeah, I really, I really don't want to do this. My, my parents said, no, you're doing it, okay? This is good for you. You need to be doing this, um, and so you are going to do it. Well, I had a paper route, and I figured out that if I took my time on my paper route, I could miss this event, all right? I knew there would be a price to pay in the end, but I drug my feet, I made people unhappy that they got their paper late, and my dad actually came driving looking for me found me and said, get home as soon as you can. I was like, "Uh uh-oh. It's never good when dad does that and drives off rather rapidly. So I got home and my dad was upset with me. I missed the event. You know, I thought I was quite clever, um, but I'd missed the event. And I found what my dad was most angry about was he pointed over in the corner of the kitchen and there was this whole outfit, football helmet decorated like a Roman helmet, a cape, um, a shirt made to look like Roman armor. Okay. My dad and my mom had put a lot of time into making that for me. And I skipped it. I didn't use it. She was hurt. All right. My dad was upset because I had disrespected him and my mother. And I still remember that. I still have that little bit of pain, that little bit of realization that my selfishness, my desire to not want to do that had cost other people. Okay. We're going to be looking at Jonah today. And Jonah, chapter 2, is prayer in particular. If you want to start turning to Jonah, chapter 2, we find that God asked Jonah to do something he did not want to do. He didn't want to do it. Jonah had this struggle with God telling him to do something. God's will did not match up with Jonah's will. He didn't want to do it. And that's something I think we can all relate to at different points in our life. Jonah didn't agree with God, so he ran. He delayed on his paper route. Okay. God said, go east. Jonah went west. Okay. So does this mean that Jonah had bad theology? He's running from God. Can he get away from God? Does he think he can get away from God? No. Jonah's theology is quite good. Okay. He knows that he can't get away from God. And we see this when he talks to the sailors. He's unperturbed by the storm. He's unperturbed by God coming after him and doing this, and he knows it's his fault. He doesn't care. 
He expects this, completely expected. He tells the sailors, no, no, this is because of me. They're trying to figure out, you know, for them, it's like, well, we've got a storm, which God's upset with us. Why is he upset? Who do we need to appease to get out of the storm? And Jonah says, they cast lots and it points to Jonah. And Jonah says, yeah, yeah, it's me. You just need to throw me overboard. I worship the God who created the sea and who created the dry land. And the Hebrew says dry land. So I worship the God that's doing this to you and is in control of where you want to get to, namely the dry land. And he says, throw me overboard. Sailors don't throw him overboard. They're appalled. They're appalled at his reaction, right? Like, ah, dude, were you dropped on your head as a baby? What? What is up with this? You're saying you've ticked off this God by running away that you know you can't get away from. Where's the disconnect? How can you be this cavalier? You're putting us in danger too. What is going on with you, Jonah? Do you eat paint chips as a kid? What's going on? You know? And in fact, they don't throw him overboard right away. They row vigorously. They finally realize there's nothing they can do. And they say, God, please don't hold us guilty for this man's death. Because in their minds, they throw him overboard. He's a dead man. But for the action of God, he is. And so they say, please don't hold us accountable. We've done everything we can. This seems to be your will. We are humbling ourselves before you. We're doing what seems to be your will. Please show us mercy. The opposite reaction of Jonah. He didn't really care about the sailors. And in fact, we will find later in the story, after his prayer, well, we'll be focusing on his prayer today, but after his prayer, we will see his issue is he wants the Ninevites to be punished. Okay. And he's afraid that God won't do that. So this ultimately led to Jonah becoming fish food. Okay. And we have Jonah's time out in the guts of a fish. I don't know if you ever received time out when you were a kid. All right. You have to go to the corner, sit in the chair, think about what you've done. Jonah, get in the fish. <laughs> think about what you've done. Get in the fish. Okay. Jonah's time in the fish will illustrate several things for us, I think, as we kind of move through chapter two of Jonah. Okay. First, the first thing is that Jonah's time in the fish shows that when faced with troubles, even of our own making, when we call out to God, He will answer. We call out to God, He will answer. Verses 1 and 2. 1 and 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and He answered me. I cried for help from the depth of of Sheol, where the dead people go, you heard my voice. Chat GPT is all the rage. Don't use it for your papers. Okay. So I asked Chat GPT, I said, I wonder what it would come up with if you were trapped in a fish. What do you do if you're trapped in a fish? <laughs> so this is its solution. Okay. Jonah calls out to the God. Chat GPT's solution is, being trapped inside a fish is an extremely unlikely and unconventional situation. <laughs> it's not something that typically happens to people. <laughs> However, if you find yourself in such a bizarre scenario, perhaps due to a misunderstanding, here are a few suggestions. One, communicate. If the fish has a mouth, try to communicate with it. Maybe it's a magical talking fish that can understand you. Two, wait for help. If you're inside a fish that's still in the water, you could wait for the fish to swim near the shore. Once it does, maybe someone will notice the unusual sight and help you out. 
I like communicate a little better, but three, use tools. If you have any tools with you, try to use them to create an opening in the fish's body to escape. It adds, just in case you're concerned, this would be highly unconventional and unrealistic, but it's all part of the imaginative scenario. Four, remain calm. Panicking won't help. And it's crucial to stay calm, even in the most absurd situations. Focus on finding a way out or on getting the attention of someone who can help. Okay. If only Jonah had chat GPT. <laughs> ah, tool, why didn't I think of that? Good thing I got my power drill. Sorry, fish. <laughs> All right. Fact of the matter is, we pray when we are desperate. We pray when we are desperate, right? We get desperate, that's when we pray. That's when we pray earnestly, that's when we mean it. Okay. I pray at every meal. There are times where it's just rote. Lord, bless this food. I want to eat. Right. I usually think about it a little and feel guilty, but it's not an earnest prayer. Not always, anyway. But when we're in a desperate situation and we've got nothing else that we can do, that's when we pray and that's when we mean it. And that's what's happening with Jonah. God, get me out of this. I know I haven't been faithful, but I will be now if you get me out of this. We bargain. We cry out, Lord, I've got nothing else I can do. Help me. Amazingly, God will respond. We cannot be sure of how he will respond, but we can be sure he hears us. Just like Jonah knew that he could not get away from God, he knew that God heard his prayer. So that's our first thing that we can take away from Jonah. When we pray, we can be sure God will hear us. Second, sometimes God will put us in a difficult situations to get us to turn back to Him. Verse 3, For you had cast me into the deep. You cast me into the deep, talking to God. Into the heart of the seas, and the currents surrounded me. All your breakers and your billows passed over me. When we are forced to that point of crying out to God, because we have no options left, we can wonder why God allowed us to be in that position in the first place. You may be partly responsible for the situation. It may have nothing to do with anything you've done. I know several students that are going through hard times right now. And they are wondering why God is allowing it to be that way. They're trying to follow His will even. It's easy to want out of the situation. It's easy to want out of the situation without ever stopping to think, what is this teaching us? What is this teaching us? What is the difficulty teaching us? What does it mean for my relationship with God that I'm in this tough situation? Because if you go back to the first point, when we're desperate, we cry out for God. It's a time when we should be looking at what God wants us to do. What does he want us to see? What does he want us to know? What is it God is teaching us about our relationship with him? But boy, howdy, I don't like those lessons. I'm pretty sure a lot of my Hebrew students feel that way about Hebrew. Right. Why, God, why? Why Hebrew? Why did you reveal yourself through Hebrew? Yet that's what he did, so we press on. And we learn through learning the language. We learn more about him. We learn about the Bible. We learn about the way he revealed himself 
and the very thoughts of God that may be different than our own when we learn a different language. So we press on. But when we're in that situation, that God puts us in that difficult situation, it may at times feel like he has abandoned us. It can feel like he has abandoned us. Verse 4, so I said, I have been expelled from your sight. When we are in a tough situation or calling out to God, it may feel like he is not there. I am sure most people can relate to this. Most people can relate that at times, and especially desperate times, it feels like God's not there. It feels like he's not listening. We can be certain that he is listening, but it may feel like he isn't listening. There was an ad a while back in a Kansas newspaper that read, I will listen to you talk for 30 minutes without comment for $5. You can tell by the price it was a while ago. It sounds like a joke, right? A hoax. But did anybody call? You bet. They did. They absolutely did. The guy that put out the ad was up to 10 to 20 calls a day in no time. The pain of loneliness, the pain of feeling like nobody hears God or anyone else. People are willing to try anything for a half hour of companionship. I know from when I was a student, I know from being a professor, and I know from my own students that every single student sits in a class at some point and feels like they're the only one experiencing that loneliness. They're the only one that's not getting it. They're the only one that doesn't fit. But you're not. There's usually at least 50% of the class that feels that way. And we have to remember that there are no situations that are beyond God. There are no situations that are beyond God. And that's the third element of Jonah's prayer in terms of what it can teach us. Verses 4 through 7. Nevertheless, I will look again to your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. So what's Jonah saying there? He's at the point of death. He's at the point of death. He feels isolated. He feels alone. Yet he is certain God hears his prayer. And he has faith in God's promises. He had faith in God's promises. Even in a seemingly impossible situation, God says, Jonah, get into fish. Think about what you've done. How do you get out of a fish in the middle of the water? Isn't that a death sentence? Does God owe you anything? Will God save you? Jonah believed he would. Okay. He believed God heard him. He believed that God was in control. The fact that he was in the fish and not dead in the sea testified to the fact that God was in control and God still had a plan. But what else does he say there? While I was fainting away, I remembered. I remembered. Okay. When we think of memory, when we think of remembering something, we think of calling it to mind. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot to do that. We've got a little bit of the idea that remembering means that you've got to do something, right? But that's secondary to remembering. We think of remembering as primarily calling something to mind. 
Okay. For the Hebrews, to remember means you're going to do something about it. When God says he remembered his people when they're in Egypt, means he's about to do something about their crying out. Remembered means action is going to be taken. It has to be taken. Action is required. And Jonah, action up to this point has been, no, I'm not doing it. Me. Jonah's got a real good teenager vibe going on. Okay. And it gets worse as the book goes on. But he remembered that means, okay, I'm going to do what you asked me to do. Okay. God told him to do something. He is now agreeing that he will do it. He remembered God. He knows what God requires. He knows God's will. He may not like it, but he's going to do it. He's agreeing to do it with that word remembered. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. That to us sounds like a lot of extra, right? We are so used to, it's kind of a little tangent, but it's an important one. We are so used to being able to pray to God anytime, anywhere. For them, they had to have these access points. They had to have connections with God because Jesus hadn't come yet. There wasn't that opening, the tearing of the curtain. Right? Communication with God was difficult. And so Jonah is envisioning his prayer going through the switchboard of the temple to get to God. And that speaks of his faith. And that speaks of the difficulty of communicating with God and yet knowing that God can overcome that difficulty. How blessed are we that because of Jesus, we can pray anytime, anywhere. We don't have to pray towards the temple. We don't have to pray towards the Daniel Lee Chapel. Okay. That is a remarkable gift that we take for granted. Jonah remembered, and he felt that he had that access to God. Fourth, we have an obligation. We have an obligation to stay true to God and our commitment to him. Verses 8 and 9. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will pay. There will be temptation to turn to other avenues of deliverance. There's temptation to turn to other avenues of deliverance. And we have an obligation to stay true to God. Jonah declares that he will be true to God, but he acknowledges that there are temptations, those who regard vain idols. What does that mean? The temptation of idolatry in the ancient world is that you have some control over the deity. You have some control over God. The God you're asking for. There's a little bit of a vending machine mentality. Okay, the, if you want something from the God, you've got to know what the God wants from you. You can tap into what the God needs. You can manipulate him if you have the right code. A4 and 50 cents. If we're living in 1990, you get the drink, right? You just have to have the right code. You have control over the deity. The God of Israel isn't so. You don't have that control. You have to depend on him. You have to rely on him. You don't get to call the shots. Okay. Jonah is referring to the idea that 
in the situations where we are desperate, in those situations when we feel like we need God to rescue us and He's not doing it fast enough, we try everything else we can first. Do I have some control? Can I fix this? How do I fix this? Sometimes you can't. And when you can't, God is teaching you, rely on me. Submit to me. We only turn to God when there is no other option left. And Jonah acknowledges he doesn't get to call the shots. He has to submit to God. There is no other option. Idols don't work. Other solutions don't work. When it comes down to it, he resisted, but he will resist no longer. And he says that he will do this with thankfulness. The fact that Jonah agrees to do it with a thankful obedience means that he will submit completely to God. Now, if you read the rest of the story, his success rate here is less than passing. He doesn't quite do it. All right. He's less than successful in terms of being thankful. In fact, he ends up sitting outside the city of Nineveh. I think I'm angry enough to die. I don't like it. Then we finally get to the main point of Jonah's prayer. The main point of Jonah's prayer is at the very end, verses 9 and 10, salvation is from the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. This was Jonah's problem. He was afraid that God was going to be merciful, that God was going to show possibility of salvation to the Ninevites. He didn't want that. And we've got to understand a little bit about the situation. It's very easy to condemn Jonah for not being gracious, isn't it? Corey Ten Boom, survivor of the Holocaust. God comes to her and tells her, 1940s, I want you to go to Hitler and the Nazi, Nazi party and tell them 40 days and God will overturn you. Probably wouldn't be too upset about that notion. But what if they repented and God says, okay, I'm going to put a buy on that judgment I had planned for you all. What if the Taliban repented and God said, leave them alone. I'm going to show them grace, though they killed thousands of Americans. Hamas. What God is asking Jonah to do with Nineveh is similar. The Ninevites, the Assyrians were awful, awful people. All right. If you look at the, I always like to see how Veggie Tales does things. Um, you got the fish slappers. All right. They're bad. Nobody likes them because they slap people with fish. All right. They're a little worse than that. They put people on poles and let them die slowly. They flayed people alive, tearing their skin off. They were cruel and mean and awful to anyone that was not an Assyrian. And they thought that they were the best in the universe. They were the original Nazis. They were awful awful people. And you can understand why Jonah would have this attitude of, you better not be merciful to them. I'm fine with judgment. 
I'm fine with preaching judgment, but I know you, God. I'm not fine with you forgiving them if they repent. I don't want them to have that chance. But at the end of his prayer, he acknowledges that God is the one that determines salvation. God is the one that determines who gets grace. Jonah may not like it, but he remembers and he agrees that God is not his co-pilot. It's not him and God making the decisions. Okay. That's a tendency we get into as we move through our lives and get senior status as a Christian. When something comes along that we don't like from God that we don't like, we negotiate, we want to talk him down of it, we don't want that to happen. Our response is no longer the initial response of the sailors and the Ninevites in the story who repent and say, please, you owe us nothing, but please show us grace. Salvation is from the Lord. He does what he does not want to do. He agrees to do what he does not want to do. I'm reminded of Jesus. Lord, Father, take this cup from me. If not, I'll drink of it but I don't want to. But you're in charge, Father. We aren't told Jonah's final decision. When we get to the end of the book, Jonah's ticked off again at God. He's irritated, frustrated, mad. He's mad about the inconvenience of being in the hot sun. He's mad because the plant that was giving him shade has died. And God is being super gracious and saying, look, this plant you were so upset about, I'm the one that grew the plant up. I'm the one that took the plant out. How do you have compassion for this plant? How do you get upset about that? Do you have a right to be upset about it? Jonah's like, yes, I've got a right to be angry, even the point of death, me. Petulant little teenage kid that says, no, I don't like it. It's all about me. We aren't told what Jonah's final decision was. God tries to meet him halfway and says, look, Jonah, all these Cute, cuddly animals will suffer. They'll suffer if I bring judgment on the Nineveh. Can you at least bring yourself to have compassion to the animals? A lot of us at different times in our lives have preferred our pets to the people in our church. Jonah, can you at least think about all the cute puppies? It's cattle, but you get the idea. We aren't told how he responds. He's left to make a decision. And that's the cleverness of the book, is that by the end of the book, you're hit with this idea that you're more like Jonah than you are the sailors or the Ninevites. And I think this should affect the way we read Jesus' words in reference to Jonah in the New Testament. Turn with me to Matthew 12. Matthew 12, verses 38 to 41. Matthew 12, 38 to 41. Matthew 12, 38 to 41. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. 
But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We all get that part. Jesus' death and resurrection. But he doesn't stop there. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they had they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The scribes and Pharisees are not happy with what God is asking them to do. Will you believe in me? Will you believe that... I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. I am God incarnate. Will you believe it? They, like Jonah, have a decision to make. They have a choice to make. The scribes and Pharisees could believe that Jesus was the Son of God, God incarnate, or they could refuse. They could follow and confess that Jesus was their Lord, and follow him, or they could vote with their actions and flee. Turn their back on him. We don't know what Jonah chose in the end. That's there to make you think. God challenged him to at least have compassion on the animals. Did he? We do know what most of the scribes and Pharisees chose. They voted with their actions. They headed towards Tarshish. They rejected God's will while confessing that they believed. We too have a choice to make. Our first choice is whether we will accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. While we can assume that most here have made that decision. There's no shame if you have not. The shame comes if you continue in that decision. Talk to me or someone you trust. If you've not decided to follow God's will, if you have not claimed Jesus as Savior, And you know you need to do that. You know that salvation belongs to the Lord. Talk to someone. Our second choice is following God's will. Ideally, this will come before God puts us in a desperate situation. But whatever the situation, while we may struggle, while we may feel alone, we know that God hears us. We know that God is in control. We know we have an obligation to keep his commandments because we love him. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. What are those commandments? Read the book. Follow God's will. Submit. Give thanks. What will you choose to do? Pray with me. Lord, it's too easy to commit with our words in a desperate situation to walk away and do nothing different after you have called us to obey you because we love you you have called us to submit to your will sometimes that's hard help us with that forgive us where we have failed you help us to be faithful even when it hurts, even when we don't like it. 
We love you, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.